Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the leading meal kit delivery service in the U.S. And while many people know what we do, many don't know about the types of meals you can eat when you cook with Blue Apron, all right? You're just not having burgers for dinner. You're making a short rib burger with hoppy cheddar sauce on a pretzel bun. You're preparing seared steaks with thine pan sauce and mashed potatoes, green beans, and crispy shallots. <laughs> in all for 45 minutes without a trip to the grocery store. You understand me? Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in this country. So do me a favor. Go check out this week's menu and get your first three meals at blueapron.com slash Joey for free. You, you're like, Joey, what are you talking about? Listen. <laughs> Your first three meals at blueapron.com slash Joey are free. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Number two, you're a fat fuck. You're athletic, whatever. You need a new gi, you need a new mouthpiece, you need a new fucking mat for your house, gym, whatever the fuck you want to do. Go to fujisports.com right now. Why, why, Joey, why should I go there? I'll tell you why. Quality, that's why. Quality. You ever go for sushi and they beat you? Not at Fuji Sports. These Japanese people are legit. They don't fuck around. You understand me? They don't fuck around. You need a new tough gi, Fuji Sports is there. You need mats, you need fucking shin guards. Whatever the fuck you need, Fuji Sports has been there since 19-something. It don't matter. <laughs> Trust me what I'm telling you. People tug on me. They choke me to death. The Fuji gi is tougher than fucking death. I've had gis. People have ripped off my back. The Fuji's still there. Go to Fujisports.com and press in. Church. Bam! Get 10% off delivered right to your fucking house like a doctor. You understand me? You know, the last guy who got a gi delivered to his house was like Bruce Lee. Some, of you, some little Chinese going brother to his house nice and iron. You understand me? Kick that fucking mule, Lee. We got Sin Quirin in the fucking house from ministry. Hey. We got the Christ killer here. Hello. We got the drummer from ministry sitting on the sidelines here. Nice gentleman. He don't say much. I like that. <laughs> I like when people don't say much. You know what I'm saying? I don't know nothing. It's a good drummer. He is. He doesn't He's talk a bad much. motherfucker. No, you don't need to talk. <laughs> Just play the drums. Are drummers oh. like the, the punters of the football team? No. Some people no, can no. get mad at the drummers? <laughs> no, no. The punters <laughs> control the fucking game. Yeah. But some of them will drive you crazy. The best ones are the ones that just drum. Just shut the fuck up and drum. There's a line of coke. Keep drumming. <laughs> There's Red Bull and milk. Do, do what you need to do. Red and get your, Yeah, and get your head together. There's some ice cubes in the freezer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> What's That's going it. on, brother? That is my problem. And here's what people don't know, but I'm honest about it. Sometimes somebody calls me and they go, hey, man, we got this guy. He's an interesting cat. And, you know, I Wikipedia you. And Wikipedia ain't your shit. It's like a background exactly. check. Yeah. It's like me coming back to you. With, oh, so, Joe, you got arrested for burglary here in 87. <laughs> and, you know what? Who gives a fuck? Right. But once you start following people and you see them in action, you're the coolest motherfucker out there. I appreciate like, that. Like, I thought man. Rudy was cool. A lot of other people. Rudy cool. is cool as so, fuck. You, you man. busted. One day you're swapping spit at the Grammys. <laughs> then then the next day you pop up with a mandolin. <laughs> then you're on stage. A couple chubby chicks are fainting in front of you, like the Beatles when they first got over to Kennedy Airport. Oh. You had a couple chubby chicks with tattoos. Those little chubby chicks at concerts, they suck dick. <laughs> they stop eating. They intermittent fast. They, they go do. to those they things. They start eating ready. guitars. Oh, man. my God. They don't give a fuck. <laughs> Those little chubby girls that tattoo, I love you and shit at the shows. They intermittent fast. Oh, they intermittent fast. They, they start do. drinking. They get fucked up. <laughs> and then somebody's going to get hurt. You understand me? Yeah. It's been interesting. Man. It's been it's an been interesting, interesting road. Man. It's been an interesting road. Um, and yeah, I mean, thank God that, you know, uh, people still show up and uh, and give a fuck, you know, what I'm doing and, and what the bands are doing and shit. But you know how it is, man. On the road, it's it's crazy, man. You see all kinds of shit out there. But it's, it's a you great know? lifestyle when you live in your grandmother's basement you find a job that covers the spread yep you know when you there's nothing like being 19 to 23 oh. and just living or to 29 a, to exist. well this 29. is a complete this is a complete different disaster <laughs> 19 Gee, to 23 man. is the fucking time oh, of your dude. life absolutely especially if you just said fuck college yeah i'm gonna play the guitar i'm gonna get a job at a hardware <laughs> store yeah and go see bands at night, four nights a week, you know? Yeah. Whatever the fuck you do. Like, I grew up with guys that that was their lifestyle. That's still yeah. their lifestyle today. Yeah, I don't condemn it at all. Yeah, they yeah. have a great time. <clears throat> but to go see bands four or five nights a week, you know, 
that's heavy duty. That's a lot of dough. Yeah. That's a lot of drugs during the week. Yeah, there's some nights you they get off stage at eleven thirty and you go right home and yeah. and you get up and you deliver towels, whatever the fuck it is that you do, just to coexist. Yeah. It's such a complete different happiness. And then one day life starts getting serious. Your grandpa tells you you're a fucking sack of shit. You gotta move out. At twenty three he was killing fucking Japanese people. <laughs> At 23, I was stabbing Japanese people. I was in a Hitler, I was in a Hitler fucking nut. You know what I'm saying? Singing Jewish songs. And shit. <laughs> sounds like a sounds like a bar more than like a oh my god a Hitler a, hut. I met a fucking dude that was talking loud one day, like young, and I couldn't handle it back then. Like I was, this was way before comedy. No, Show well. me his numbers on his arm and shit. At a drunk yeah. at a oh bar, he was drunk one night. This guy, yeah, and he was telling me he was one of Hitler's huts and. Uh, what they do to you in there, God you know, damn, that's a man. fucking nightmare when yeah. you get those people live and in concert. Yeah. <laughs> you get, you get, you get when they're headlining, dude. Of, oh, yeah. You give one of those poor Jews two bottles of Manischewitz and they take you into murky waters. You got to do 18 eight balls just to coexist. You go home more depressed than watching Eyewitness News. This is 40 minutes of, oh, my God, I had never seen that before. <laughs> wow. I still remember the bar in New York, not the name and where the first time I met a Holocaust survivor was, <laughs> who was hammered. He was hammered. He had every right to be hammered. Yeah. If he, if he didn't have the numbers on his arms, I would, he had everything. Like, I mean, Fuck, he just dude. broke it down. And, and, you know, I was listening to his story. I started getting sad. Like, it just yeah. reminded me of everything bad in my fucking life. Like, sure. I don't even know how we talked about Holocaust survivors. What fucking podcast <laughs> ends up on Holocaust survivors? Opens up one, with. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. This is this is not good. This is no bueno. <laughs> I think it was a Christ so, killer. I think, I think I don't know. Like, thank God we don't eat edibles no more on this show. <laughs> now at least we're coherent. We're coherent at least. We do two, three bong hits. Everybody's fucking happy. That those those edibles are killed. People keep keep coming. Oh, Joey, you lost so much weight because I stopped eating edibles. <laughs> eating edibles, you go home at night and you just lose control. Yeah. Like I was sitting there one night thinking about how I used to kill that refrigerator. My wife would buy those packages of salami. Yeah. She's like, it'll last two or three days. No, they won't. <laughs> like two, three hours. I would kill those packages. I would kill the whole Fuck. package of salami and half the package of American cheese. Damn. Two bags of popcorn, three bags of popcorn, graham crackers. Ooh. You know, and you start light. Like, you, you, you lie to yourself. Well, yeah. I got a yogurt with strawberries and, <laughs> and some fucking nuts. What are those? What yeah, are those yeah being healthy. You start with that. Yeah. And then it was just, I, I just go into the worst foxhole in my life. <laughs> So I stopped with the edibles and I lost thirty fucking pounds. Awesome. That's how much. Wow, how much those edibles? Were when did really... you stop? Gradually. Yeah, uh, like I did two edibles yesterday. Don't get me wrong. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> They're I, not completely I, I out. Two hundred milligrams scaled it down, around, right? <laughs> but they weren't that strong. The edibles. I ate them more for the flavor. This guy what are you I know. Talking about? <laughs> this guy I know makes a fucking beef jerky, an edible with yeah. filet mignon. Oh, he said. And his wife is Thai. Must I tell you anymore? And wow. she fucking dopes it up. He says there's like 100 milligrams per package, per ounce. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday I ate two packages. I had to kill them all my Weight Watcher points. Damn. Dude. I had these Weight Watcher points left over. I said, I might as well kill them. Use them here. I walked around a little bit yesterday, so I yeah. said, let me kill this jerky just to see what it does to me. <sighs> Fuck. It was good. I passed out two hours in the afternoon. Nice. That's how I took a nap. You in stopped the too, Lee? Uh, mostly, I did. I was telling you guys before the podcast. I there's been been a couple of times where I get too high, and it's not even because that happens every time with me. Is, is you, you? How many stars did you eat the other night when you only, thought you were only, low potassium? Only two. Yeah, that's it. We're done. Our tolerance, wow. our tolerance was so high, sin. It was. Uh, oh, we were taking sixteen hundred. It was ugly for on a, a while. light night. It was really ugly Ooh. for a while because there was a time I was just poisoning. Wow. Like, I would get them in the afternoon <laughs> and get the 180, the Chibachu, uh -huh. and I would take the wrapper off the 180 and put it in a 60. Fuck. And tell him it was a, 60, it was a 60. And yeah. he would eat half of it, and it was really 90. And he would get fucked up. And then there was a cookie that was really 200, but I told him it was 100, and he'd eat <laughs> half of it. So I was building this tolerance, and he had sure, no that, idea. That, that's one word for it. Oh, my God, I can't. You were in training. Oh, and, yeah. Then we did the and liquid now acid. Is nothing. Oh, we got. We did the we, liquid we, acid. We did both kinds of acid. One night I put fucking little heroin dust in the bong, and you should have seen him, dog. <laughs> he was, hey, so what was it that you he gave? He was not, not. <laughs> what was it that you gave Polly Shore? 
an edible. Just eat, yeah, wait, a little. But he a just half I, a star. because he just he didn't even have the whole thing. Right? No, that star is strong. And he that's like a, that really fucked him yeah, up. Yeah, right? at that time those stars were strong. Like these stars you're eating whole too. Yeah. You put them in the freezer, they're six months old. We haven't gotten a star here in No, yeah, they might be long, older than that. Older than that. So they're wow. really concentrated now. They'll take you to it. It's like eating like an ex- uh, uh, Dude. It's like eating like a Vicodin that's two years old. You're flying like an old, you had surgery like in, in <laughs> 99. Years ago and, you're like, and you fucking find the Vicodin. You're like, yeah. well, let me see if this shit works. Like, that shit works, dog. <laughs> it will work. It will have you burping and shit like that. But who gives a fuck? Oh my god! Yes, wow. and you're like just know, a man. fucking, you know, man. You look at a guy and you play some of the band in your head, <clears> and you <throat> think he has this weird lifestyle. Have you yet seen Steven Tyler on Joe Rogan? I did. I did. I did. I did watch you think that. Of that. You know, I I dug it. I think Steven. I mean, he's a character. He's the real deal. He's the real. Like deal. he's not. There's no. Um, yeah, th- it's no, not an no, act. No, 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 no. Like no, 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 that no, no, no. is him. And I mean, we played. We played with Aerosmith last June at the Download Festival in the UK. And uh, I mean, we you know we get to see a different side of that. We get to see a lot of the the behind the scenes stuff. Um, but he, I had a great time watching that podcast joe's podcast with steven because he's just so the dude's like on 11 constantly and he's such a like eccentric dude but it's not an act it's not fake it's really who he is like he's really going a thousand miles an hour constantly and that really is how he lives his life like he's constantly he's everywhere when he wrote his time when he read his timeline no, dude, dude, yeah, and we complain. Like, yeah, I know, like, I know. His schedule is like it's. It it's was ridiculous. Insane. It's insane. Yeah, it's I ridiculous. wish that's my schedule at yeah. seventy. Yeah, right. You wish yeah. that's your schedule at dude, 70. seventy years old, dude. And he d- does not do his schedule. I don't know if you saw that podcast or not. He, he was like going down like his his like his itinerary day. for Lee, like you'll die. yeah, you'll die. It is like every hour he's got like pretty much something going on, and he's traveling, he's flying, he's like going everywhere. Red eyes. Yeah. Yeah, 70, red eyes. Yeah. I'm 55. I take a red eye, I'm crushed for three fucking yeah. days. Yeah. It was it's, amazing uh, to watch, dude. It really was. You know, when you, you ever meet like a band that you like, and you start talking to the singer, and he's not the <clears> sharpest <throat> tool in the fucking shed. Constantly. And you're uh, like, oh my God. This, and then the bass player is just as goofy. Oh, yeah. And then there's one guy in the band that's like a, a five beta cap. Yeah. This motherfucker knows everything. You can tell yeah. he's the one that does everything for the band. Yeah. When I was looking at Steven Tyler, this is what I kept thinking about. Like, I remember walking to Sea Caucus, New Jersey, summer of 76 or 77, mm. to see Journey, Aerosmith, and Ted Nugent. Wow. And I can't even tell you the undercard. The undercard was like Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush. Wow. Poco. Damn. Like it was just it was just an all day festival. One of those twelve o'clock. Yeah. Aerosmith is taking the stage at seven. And I gotta tell you something right now. The band I was excited, like my friends were excited for Ted. Mm-hmm. I was more excited for Aerosmith. Sure. I was a fan of at that time I was a fan of rocks. Mm-hmm. And the one with Big Ten Inch on it, Toys in the Attic. Or whatever. Yeah. I don't even yeah, know yeah. what the fuck I was a fan of. Yep. But I wasn't a fan of Get Your Wings yet. Okay. All right. That's the second album. Right. That became my all-time favorite. I went down there, and Aerosmith was so fucking bad. Journey was amazing. Journey didn't mm-hmm. miss a note. Aerosmith went up then, fell apart at the seams. Everybody, wow. else was, everybody else was great. Then they broke the guitar, like, for no reason. You didn't do nothing to excite me to break the fucking guitars right. and shit. <laughs> and then Ted went on and just destroyed. Ted mm-hmm. was in this prime, right. 76, 77, yeah. Yeah. prime yeah. Ted, you know. Yeah. And I remember walking home and feeling bad for Aerosmith. But going back to see them. Like, I went back to see them mm-hmm. some other time and just as bad. Wow. No. Just as bad. Like, when they released Night at the Ruts, a little bit before Night at the mm-hmm. Ruts. And then they released Night at the Ruts and they fell apart. Joe Perry left, Brad uh-huh. Whitford left, right. and I went to see him again. But now, guys, it wasn't the stadium, and it wasn't the theater in the city. It was the same bars that Twisted Sister Holy shit, and all dude. these people were playing. It was called the Soap Factory in Ridgefield Park or Fairview wow. Park, one of those parks, New Jersey. Yeah. And he was horrible. Really? 
I mean, the tickets were like 12 bucks or something. Damn, dude. And it was him with the new guitar player, yeah. the new bass yeah. player. And they were just fucking, he was high. Wow. And what I remember the most from that night is there was a guy standing in front of me. And he was nodding on heroin. <laughs> and he kept having a cigarette in his hand. But it was 1977, 76, 78. And yeah. it was the age of the halter top. Only old people know what that is. A halter <laughs> top is a tube yeah. that a woman gets into. And she doesn't wear a bra under that tube. And the tits would be banging. <laughs> You'd see the nipples, but the back would be exposed. Yeah. So every time this junkie would nod, I'd push him into the girl, and he would burn her back with a cigarette, and the girl would turn around and haul off and smack the guy. <laughs> this went on like eight times. He burned a different broad. <laughs> Girls would go, Jesus Christ, you should burn me, and they would move. And every time the guy nod, I'd push, push him into him a broad, and he'd get smacked again. This went on with the warm-up act. For like 30 wow. minutes. And then we had to wait for Aerosmith to set up. And we started doing it again. I started pushing the guy again. Finally, on one of those nods, he just fell. Out. And people started stepping on him. I mean, they were a oh, violent shit, jersey crowd. They were man. stepping on him. He never said, him. stop pushing me? Nothing. He didn't even know. He would just I didn't fall. know where the fuck he was. Dog, he would fall asleep and get into a crouch position. <laughs> right there. I would just bump into him. <laughs> like nothing happened he would fall over and burn the girl with the cigarette <laughs> Jesus. Damn. and then the girl would wake him up smack him <laughs> he would straighten up all right i won't smoke two minutes later there he is uh, back at it again and me and my buddy would be eyeballing him wait till he nods we'd watch him nod push him into the chick burn him this went on and then finally he passed out and people started kicking him damn oh my god aerosmith takes the stage <laughs> steven tyler is up there he's fucking done mm -hmm. he's skinny you could see it but he was like, like shit. Yeah. they're done they're done wow you knew they were done this has to be 79 80 yeah. yeah done and brother it ended up with him getting punched in the face 20 times and oh. him running off stage holy fuck and that was it aerosmith was done wow aerosmith was done i'm in colorado three years late in a hotel with a chick and i'm watching mtv mm -hmm. and mtv news goes up to Boston, mm -hmm. and they go, we're in a high school where rumors are reporting that Aerosmith is getting back together again. Yeah. And they went through rehabs, and they were all, and then they couldn't show them. It, it showed like them sh cutting through a glass and trying to get a peek at Aerosmith mm -hmm. rehearsing, mm -hmm. and you could hear them. Wow. <clears throat> and that was it. Aerosmith released an album called Done With Mirrors that was hot garbage, mm -hmm. hot mm -hmm. garbage. It came out 85, maybe, it was yeah. just hot garbage. They had a song that Joe Perry had written called, uh, it was the name of his album. I, I, who knows? It was just a god-awful album. And then Run DMC comes mm -hmm. into the picture, does Walk This Way. I remember and that. they get fucking a life resurgence. They ended up making more money than what they did on yeah. the first fucking turnaround because now they knew what they were doing. That brought them back. That brought man. them back. Though. Big time. And right there when I'm watching Tyler on Rogan, I'm seeing this. All this yeah. is coming back to me going, this is the reason why. Yeah. Look at him. He's 70 years old, and he's a fucking savage. Yeah. He never gave up. Mm -hmm. And even when they were talking about doing ayahuasca, and he goes, I would never do it because it would hit that right. trigger. Right. That means you're very, you know who the fuck you are. Exactly. It takes years yeah. to really find out who the fuck you are. I'm yeah. not going down there because I'm going to smack somebody. And that same. dude survived it, man. I mean, he's been through it all, and he's still standing. And I think, I mean, he's he's sharper than ever right now. You know, he's um, more coherent and more on top of it than he was back in the day, dude. Because he they went through some fucked up times yes, dude, they where they were just, I mean, I've seen that firsthand with a lot of my friends. And it's not pretty, you know, it, it's not it's not pretty to watch that and to see somebody talented who is just on the brink of just fucking completely losing everything. Any and drugs in your life? It. Never. Really? Mm -mm. No marijuana, no alcohol? Never smoked, never drank, never done any drugs. Aside from when I'm in the hospital. But that's about it. You happy? You with that Very. decision? That yeah. decision was always a good one. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you know, I, I don't... Um, I don't, you know, look down on anyone for doing anything. I don't judge anyone for anything. It just worked for me. Um, and there's no real reason behind it other than I was just never curious about it. That's, like, really the reason. Mom, dad, drugs? No, 
They uh, no, I mean my dad would would have a a few beers a year. Um, they didn't smoke. They didn't do any drugs. Um, so I never really saw that. But I mean, you know, growing up in a in a with Mexican you know relatives. I mean, all my uncles. I mean, typical you know uh, Mexican family. Just uncles always hammered and and you know it was a, something I grew up with and saw. But it never. It just never interested me. I was honestly too focused on music from the time I was six years old. Because that's when I realized this is what I was going to do. Um, I honestly had just tunnel vision. And I didn't, I saw what it was doing to some of my friends who just didn't have any control and were just going off the deep end. And it kind of like made me think, fuck, you know, if I do that, I'm going to end up like that and I'm going to lose focus on what I'm here to do. And I mean, I knew at an early age that this is what, you know, I was going to try to do. How old were you when you knew music was? Six. Six. You Mm -hmm. knew. I knew when I heard Kiss Alive. That was it, man. That was the record that did it for me. At that point, I was like, when I heard Kiss Alive, I honest, I remember telling my cousin, who was five years older than me, who played it for me, I remember telling him, this, that's what I'm going to do. Like, this is what I'm going to do. And that was honestly, I mean, the, the, my own, has been my only focus since then. So that's a, that's a big part of why I guess I didn't do anything because I, I honestly felt like, if I do that, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna have no control and just you know end up going off the deep end. What was the first instrument you picked up? Guitar. It uh, it was like ten. And then what did you move on to? I always stayed on the guitar, but I mean, I, I thought I you play myself, the bass and yeah, I, I taught myself how to play the bass. I played some drums. I taught myself keyboards. I played the saxophone all through junior high and high school. And I was fucking dude. I was in a marching band, and I was in the fucking. I was like a total band geek in school. And um, so I played the sax for six years and and shit like that. And um, but the guitar has always been my main instrument. You know, I read an article after you were on the show the first time. I, I hate when somebody comes on the show, and I find out so much more about them afterward. There was an article you did, an interview of your writing process. Like I didn't know you were Grammy nominated. All this shit, you know. There was just so many little things I didn't know about you. And I felt ashamed. Yeah, oh, man. But once I got to see you, like, on the mandolin and all that stuff, that, you know, whatever the fuck you have, yeah, ukulele. Yeah, kind of shit. I pick it all up, dude. Yeah, it's just <laughs> you're an interesting fucking, you know, man, nobody's interesting anymore. Like, people, if they are interesting, they're faking the funk to me. Yeah. You know, people think they're interesting when they talk politics and they show you how smart they are. Right. And you can tell how fucking ignorant they are. You know, yeah. you're like, this is what you want to talk about. Yeah. It's on the news every night from 6 to 6.48. Exactly. I need this shit in my life from you, you know. <laughs> so it's weird when somebody's genuinely interesting from the heart that you go, fuck, send us that. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate you that. You know, man. I love when I find little shit not about people. Like, yeah. all right, Steven Tyler. When you see a guy like Steven Tyler, yeah. you look at the other guy, Pirate of the Caribbean. Yeah. And, Johnny Depp. and he's a fucking fake in the funk <laughs> right. motherfucker. Totally. Like, if you can't totally. tell by seeing that, right. when you see, you know, like, that's the first person I thought of. Because yeah. I've seen him walking around. It's a big... You know, he's been living in this fantasy, Johnny Depp, yeah. for 25 it's years. Almost, cool. yeah. It's almost, dude, when when I see people like that, um, and not just him, but like other people, it's almost like they're putting on a costume or yes, something, yes, he, and they want to like play that role. And you can see the difference. I mean, and that's a great um, comparison there between Steven and him. You see Steve, you get the sense that Steven... That's no outfit. That's no costume. That is. That's who he is. And then you see other guys like that, and you're like, yeah, you know that that guy was like, okay, what am I gonna wear today? What am yeah. I gonna put on to try to make people think I'm this, or you know, give them that perception that I'm you know uh, a certain way when truly they're not. Do you ever so, go to a Hollywood party by mistake, and you're in there six minutes? I have, and you're asking yourself. What the fuck the are you fuck? doing there? Yeah, like, I have. And the, like for me, first I ask myself that question, but then it's the second question. You know what that question is? Maybe it's not even a question. <clears throat> the statement that comes out of my brain is maybe it's you that's fucked up. So now I turn into Lee on two edibles. <laughs> I stand there with my foot on the wall, half fucking going through an anxiety attack, asking myself why I'm not like these people. <laughs> 
Right. How come I couldn't wear an orange shirt and put grease in my hair right. and come down here with an entrance and make believe I'm somebody I'm not? I mean, right. why can I do that? I went, like I said, I went to this, I'm dying up here, put me in a few episodes, and they invited me to like this party. Mm-hmm. They invited me to the rap party and stuff. I was out of town. You know, when somebody puts you in a few episodes, Jesus Christ, the least you could do is show up, wave. <laughs> right. <laughs> they had little finger food, and I could bring a guest. I said, let me take my wife out on a date. It's a Monday night. I killed two birds sure. with one stone. Number two, we'll stop and get Cuban food. Right. Because the thing is in Hollywood. Right, right. So we'll kill that fucking need to get some black beans and rice. <laughs> and I do it right. And then we go to a party. If the food sucks, you're not sitting there going, oh, the food right. sucks. You knew the food was going to suck. Right, right. They're fucking geeky fucking white people in Hollywood. What do you think they're going to give you? You know, mango wrapped, <laughs> right, you know, exactly. guava, whatever. <laughs> Where's the cheeseburgers? Where's the fucking steak a la mode? Where's the fucking, you know? But you get there and they have something completely different, you know? Right. We have, uh, what's the new thing, those french fries they give you? Truffle fries? No, the other ones. The, 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 the sweet potato. Oh, sweet potato. You come at me with a sweet potato <laughs> french fry, we're going to have a fucking problem, all right? Don't bring a sweet potato fry. The one thing I agree with you on. What? You, they had pizza yeah, that weren't bad. But right away, we have goat milk goat cheese pizza why can't it just be regular mozzarella pizza yeah give me the one with the regular cheese no we don't have it then they bought b- b- wings which i won't eat out no more yeah no. because they're just nasty no yeah. one makes them were they like pigeon one. wings or something yeah they're like pigeon <laughs> wings you know if you're gonna eat a wing go to buffalo take the still fucking with the note attached and yeah shit on there dude yeah and then you bro i saw something the other day that was creepy as shit i saw them finally wash the grill at 7-eleven the other <laughs> Oh. That ISIS grill, that ISIS fucking yeah. juice that comes out of those hamburgers. <laughs> that poor little Hindu is behind there holding his eyeballs and shit. Those fumes from those hot dogs. They're not hot dogs. Those, those things will kill you. Oh, the oh, only God. hot dogs that are good are the Oscar Mayer ones, which I, th- I think they took out. Mm. And fucking just put regular ISIS bro- dogs now. <laughs> Stretch out of the Philippines. They got fucking dog noodles and eyeballs in them and shit. They got everything. They have those. Have you looked in those little see-through fucking croquettes they have? No, I haven't. Like, either go yet. to Seven Eleven and stand online just to oh. look at what's in there and just play guess what's in there. <laughs> guess the food. Guess what's in that fucking wrap. You could see it's coming right through. Like oh. if you eat that, you will fucking take an ambulance ride for eighteen hundred. <laughs> Do you think that going back to the uh, the people who kind of fake the funk? Do you think they go home and there's someone different, or do you think they've just turned themselves into? When they go home, like... they fucking cry. <laughs> you think so? <laughs> they go home and cry. You think Johnny Depp is crying? They go home and cry. Some part of their life has to be dark because they really can't be who they want to be. That's a weird thing yeah. for some people, having to go home. You know, people who actually go out there and go, "Hmm, what could I attach myself <laughs> to? Maybe I'll right. attach myself to gay people. Hang out with gay people." And that looks cool because I hang out with gay people. Don't make me fucking cool. I read right through it. No. Then there's the people who one day go, you know what? I think I'm going to become a rocker. If you're not a rocker in high school, you're never going to be a rocker. I knew you were a rocker chick when you were 16. There's a chick on Facebook. I've been talking to a daughter. You know, a daughter is aspiring. So I've been going back and forth with her. She was a rocker in high school. Yeah. When, she, when we were 16, she was sucking 18, 19 year old dick. Somebody who played the bass. In the band, you know, and I wasn't mad at her. I ain't mad at her. She's getting quality dick at fucking she's 15. She's blowing the guy in the town yeah, show. Yeah, she's getting into the fucking bars at yeah. 21. Yeah. But still, I'm not mad at her. That's what you do. You're into bands. But she's a stoner. <laughs> These chicks now that yeah. just wear like, you know, like when they had those concerts now in uh, the <clears throat> desert. No, uh, the what Coachella. Coachella, Coachella oh, okay. What, you know what it is? It's rich kids who go buy a shirt. They don't know nothing about the band. Nothing, nothing. They never, you know, a uh, big thing that happened last week was they were talking about how your boy, Nine Inch Nails, did something this year for this tour. Mm-hmm. He fucking made people go down and buy the tickets physically and stand online and wait for him to commit. No fucking online ticket sales. Wow. Because he wanted to bring it back to the old school. And I like that. I'm like, you know what, bro? That sounds like a ballsy fucking move. That throws your fans off. But no, it doesn't. It makes your real fans yeah. put time into you. But the, you know that the tickets are still now they're oh dude, they're they're I'm sure they're online and like they're already, you know. Nine being, inch nails? Yeah. Yeah. Somebody but, yeah. But it's different to stand online. It's a lot easier if I tell you to be a scalper and you have to just buy twenty chunks right. online. Go stand down there and show your yeah. face. It's kinda creepy. Yeah. 
So I think in a way, it's it, yeah, yeah. Well, I remember that's what it was like back in the day. Dude. Yeah, like you had to go to the fucking box office oh, and like I mean that's what we did. How old do you? Now, you know, forty nine. So you, I you, still, oh, dude. I remember back in the seventies, dude. That's what I used to do, man. I still remember you know? sending a check in, a money order, so you could order four tickets. Yeah, so yeah. Let's <laughs> I remember that. Okay, too. you could order four tickets. So <laughs> Ministry was playing yeah. uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Me, you, and Lee would get together. He would send in a check for Thursday. I'd send in a check for Friday. You send the check in for Saturday. We're partners on the deal. Yep. We, we might get Thursday and Saturday, which we'll take. Yeah. But at least we've got a chance. So now we're definitely going. God forbid all three of us could get tickets. Get <laughs> yeah. And we go Thursday, Friday, Saturday. That yeah. was the treat back then. Right. So you had the mail, but then you also had standing on line. Mm -hmm. Pink Floyd, the wall. I went right to Ticketron, fifteen dollars wow. and fifty cents. Fucking Ticketron, dude. You know, the other day Eddie That's... Trunk was talking about how you, the guy would turn around and go into a card file, yeah, and show you what seats were available. Right, right. I, remember I was that, like, I had dude. goosebumps when Eddie Trunk was talking about. Yeah. I'm like, oh my god, I used to go to this place called Things from England. Hmm. It's still there, Cliffside Park, New Jersey. Hmm. If you didn't want to go to the Garden, he would have the tickets. He'd charge you a little big, yeah, ten bucks. For going into the city, it was worth it. Worth it, yeah. You went and got me tickets for ten bucks. Go, yeah. I'll pay the twenty three dollars. Yeah. yeah, I could go over there, stand like an animal, and pay the toll, and play hooky and get caught, yeah. and get robbed, and go to a peep show. But you know what? <laughs> Fuck it. Maybe get blown. <laughs> yeah, it's all. It's, call it a day, dude. <laughs> I would never get blown in at that age. Like I was trying to get my dick sucked at twelve, thirteen. Like everybody's trying to get sure. their dick sucked. We would go to a little strip club, right? Right oh off of, uh, it was right in Manhattan, right off Broadway. They didn't give a fuck how old you were back yeah. then. Like, they just didn't <laughs> give a fuck. Yeah. And I remember them calling us in, and you could sit on the girl's lap. And our job was to just feel them up as much as we could <laughs> till the tab came. And then, they, because then the girls always would go, Would you buy me a drink? And while you're waiting for the drink, you're feeling their tits. You're like 13, you're like a barracuda. You got hands all over them. You're like Cosby times 18. You're like Cosby with Harvey. And the girls never said, like, hey, nothing, this little kid's touching my tits? Nothing. That you're grabbing that pussy. Then the drink comes, and it's like $40. And you're like, I ain't got $40. Get the <laughs> fuck <laughs> out of here. You just felt her up. Fingered, like you didn't really finger her. You fingered it through the jeans. And when you're 13, that's that's good enough for that's me. That's enough, dude. I yeah. wouldn't wash my hands for two, three days. <laughs> I, if I put my hand between your crotch and I got some of that pussy juice at a strip club, what a disgusting. These women were disgusting. <laughs> Disgusting. I was no fucking prize catch either. I was 13 with a half a bozo hairdo on my dick. <laughs> the top was empty, but the sides were full. Who wants to suck a 13-year-old dick? Nobody wants to suck a 13-year-old dick. 14, maybe. Once you get that hair, right. you get one of those school teachers to suck your dick or a fucking babysitter. <laughs> uh, I never got a babysitter to suck my dick. One time when I was like six... I had a Puerto Rican babysitter. I asked her to suck my dick. She told me she'd suck my dick. At I, six? Oh, my God. I went and took a shower and everything. I hated showers when I was six. I hated them. Hated them. You got ready for her? Oh, I put cologne on. I put a gold sure. chain on. <laughs> At six. I put some underwear on. I went back to my room. You're good underwear? In a robe. Her name was Tita, and she was Puerto Rican. Oh. And fucking, she went back in the room and blew on my stomach. But I gave her like a bag full of change. She told me for the small 20, she would suck my dick. Really? So I gave her like a bag full of nickels. You didn't pay for a blowjob in, in yes, coins. Yes, Please I tell did, me. Oh. Yes, I did. And she took it. And she told me that was it. I'm like, listen, dog, you know I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> and that morning, I feel Saved so. my whole life for that. Till this fucking day, I think of, whenever I think about this, it's when I'm on the playground with my daughter. I'm looking at her. <laughs> I must like, have dude, been, I must have been six, six and a half. Damn. And I remember like waking my mom up that morning, like, Mom, I gotta talk to you. And my mom putting on the sandals, you know, hung over. Right. Poor Denora, hung over as fuck. You know, she just walked in at three thirty, the bar uh -huh. closes at three. Right. We were living in New York City. She used to get home at a quarter to four for that. And I would wake her up like at seven thirty and make me breakfast and <laughs> and go off on her about whatever happened the night before with the babysitter. <laughs> That poor woman, I'll never forget her making me, like, eggs or something. I don't know what she would make for breakfast in those days that I would eat. And me looking at her going, listen, I got to talk to you about something. And she's like, I, I, I go, listen, I give teeth. 
20 bucks last night. And coins. Like, my mom, being, you know, I was trying to tell mm. her in English right. to loosen the pain. Right. And I didn't really know that much English. So yeah. I'm like, Ma, I gave T the 20 bucks to, to give me a blowjob, you know, to suck my dick. And my mom's going, like, what are you talking about? Antonio, what are you talking Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, Ma. Like 20 pesos, me dijo que me mamó la pinga. Entonces me mamó la pinga. My mom's like, are you fucking crazy? Like, it's, <laughs> it's a quarter to eight. And you're talking about getting your dick. You were six years old. I'm like, that's the point. She told me she was going to suck me. And now I'm going off in Spanish. Yeah. And my mom's <laughs> like, you're not saying this to me at fucking 7.30 in the morning that this poor baby said it. And then she woke her up. Like, Dita, can look at the bus. What's he saying? <laughs> And she's like, he asked me for a blowjob, and I told him I took his money. That's not the way they talk to a lady. And my mom's like, I agree. And I'm like, fuck <laughs> that. I'll kill her right fucking now in her sleep. And they were scared of me. Like, at that time, my mom knew I was dead. My dad had died. I was yeah. off the I got hit in the head with a flashlight, yeah. with a lunchbox. I was going off the fucking rail. I was taking karate and shit. So my mom knew I was serious. I go, if you don't give me the $20 right now, I'll fucking stab it tomorrow night. My oh mom's my like, God. you know what? I'm going to give you the $20. do not talk to her no more. Just stay the fuck away from her. I didn't talk to that bitch for like a year, dog. Wow. She took my 20. Yeah. Damn. Oh, yeah. Fuck. Anything like that ever happened to you, Lee? No, no. I, I can't. I Like, where, where are you going to get a knife? What are you talking? Like, <laughs> I just imagine you like on, on like on top of the table with like a knife, like I yelling at your mother in Spanish. Oh, yelling at her from the top of my lungs. <laughs> she better give me my fucking money. I'm going to fucking cut her and all this shit. <laughs> and my mom's like, Like a straight razor or something? Like, like, I don't know. Happening? Who knew? Who knew what the fuck was going on? You know, who the fuck knew? <laughs> and then when I was about 14, no. Oh when I was about God. 13, she was still my stepfather. She brought a chick home for me one night. When I was about 13 in the eighth grade, they brought a woman home one night. They yeah. woke me up in the middle of the night. They're like, go downstairs. Just having my bar mitzvah at 13. And I'm downstairs, and all of a sudden, the guys <laughs> are down there from the bar, and they're like, oh, yeah, go, go wash up and put, like, a suit on. This chick's going to suck your dick. And I'm like, come on. Really? Like, yeah, your mother brought her home for you to suck your dick. So I went upstairs and took my pajamas off and shit. <laughs> the and shower. I put a little suit on. Yeah, yeah. I came back like fucking Pierre Cardin. <laughs> I started dancing with her. When I touched the pussy the first time, I got like dizzy, dog. Yeah. Like I got dizzy. Sure. Yeah, you're still side. wearing pajamas. Yeah. That's too upstairs. young to get your dick to. this day, I don't remember if I fucked her. Oh if I God. passed out, I think I just passed out from the anxiety. <laughs> well, dude, that first time that that happens, dude, it's like <laughs> your head just yeah, gets Yeah, it was terrible. Up, it was terrible. <laughs> Like, you don't know what the how fuck we, happened, How were you the first time you fell in love? Like, fell in love, uh, and you were heartbroken, well. that you still remember that bitch's name today. Um, and if you were bump into her in the Sherman Oaks Gallery, <laughs> you might hit her in the head because she fucked your shit up for two years and shit. Um, I was probably, well, 19, maybe. And she broke your heart? Yeah. How'd she break your heart? Uh, I mean, it was just a typical, you know, breakup kind of thing, and and uh, she ended up like uh, uh, she was, you know, with someone else behind my back kind of thing, and I found out about it. Hurts, and it was just, it? Yeah, because yeah. that was the first one, you know what yeah, I mean? That yeah. was like really like that, and so I mean, that's really it. it wasn't a huge thing, but for me back then, when it's the first chick that you're really in love with. Um, and you find that kind of, you know, you find out that kind of shit. It's it's pretty fucking, you know, traumatic at that age, and you're like, fuck everything. I just want to die, and like everything sucks, and you know, it's just fucked up, dude. And and um, the skinny bitch yeah. broke my heart when I was about twelve. She just fucked me up. I got left back. I mean, I got fucked. I stopped going to karate. Really? And she wasn't even. Here's the dumb thing. Like I felt till this day, I still feel bad talking about it. Because I was such an asshole, like I deserved it. Mm. Like I bought into love and roses. Mm -hmm. I took mm -hmm. her and her grandmother to a movie. Who does that? Like two or three times, I had to take the grandmother to the movie with. Wow. If I knew what I knew today, I would have fucking stabbed them. I would have told the grandmother to suck my dick. <laughs> well, I would have fingered the grandmother at the movie theater. That's, That's how crazy. While you watch Caligula. Yeah, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> You're gonna put, take four dollars and, and cop it on my action. I'm trying to feel up your granddaughter here. And you're over here playing fucking Rocco the Cop. With <laughs> <his fucking Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Lee? How old were you? I was young. I was like maybe six. And I, we didn't even. I was so. Six. Damn. I no, feel no, no, old. no, no. Like sixth grade. Like, like oh, sixth, sixth, grade. sixth, seventh grade. She was like, not my neighbor, but pretty much. You know, 
How long have you been asking me to take walks, Joey? We would take walks every fucking day with our dogs. I touched her boobs, but I was I was way too scared to do anything with her. And then years later, she said she had a crush on me too. But and of course, looking back, I should have tried to kiss or something. But I was just so she got what like twelve, thirteen, something, something like, like that. that. Yeah, she she gave me a lap dance once. How old were you when she gave me a lap dance? <sighs> this was the lap dance. I had a front door that stepped up, and I I laid down on my front on the floor of my house. And she just like kind of like grinded on me for like two seconds. How old were you? I don't know. She moved away like in high school, so maybe thirteen, fourteen. Like that was it, though. Like that, it, it was like two seconds. It wasn't. She didn't take anything off. It was. It was in the middle of the fucking day. I just had trees around my house. <laughs> But she was hot. Shit, that's more action than I. I didn't get any. No, dude, I, I had no fucking action. I didn't kiss her. I didn't do anything. I just she, she just kind of jiggled again, around that's for a more second. action that I fucking had, dude. Oh, I didn't have any. I didn't. I didn't get any until I was seventeen. Oh, I didn't have which sex was until, late. Yeah, nineteen, twenty. Like late compared to like my friends and shit like that, who were all like they'd already gotten you know late at fourteen, fifteen, you know. I don't um, count that so shit. I was like that disgusting shit. I don't count my police record. I, I don't, was I like, don't talk you know, about that <laughs> because like when was the first time you got laid that you were in love? That's when it counts for me. Then like, I my was, friends took me to a hooker house one time. Yeah, and it was disgusting. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you got your dick sucked, but it was under fucked up circumstances. Right. She was half asleep on a quaalude, something. You know what I'm saying? There was always some. Bill was in the room. <laughs> yeah, something was going on. Like I got caught fingering this girl one time. Oh I'm fingering in the front yard, and her father goes, you got to come in. And he's like, now. And my hand's down her fucking oh, pants, and the father fuck. knew it. I was fingering her outside. Smoke was coming. It was like 10 <laughs> degrees. Yeah. And you could see her pussy had like heat coming it's on out fire. Because I was fingering it like a fucking sewing machine. Da, 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 da. That was a sewing machine. We live in a sewing machine neighborhood, and you would hear those sewing machines going off. And I go, Jesus Christ, I want to finger bang somebody <laughs> with that intensity. With that rhythm. <laughs> with that fucking rhythm. I had her. I was like in the eighth grade. I had her out there. They were German and they hated Spicks and oh, Niggas. Fuck yeah. The father and the brother were fucking. Uh, oh. They hated fucking Spicks and Niggas. <laughs> the father, the brother would say it to me. Spicks and Niggas should all die. <laughs> and shit. Yeah. And Damn. look, and but when I finger the sister. He lost all face. <laughs> like, even now, he won't friend me on Facebook because, bitch, how's it feel? I was finger banging your sister to death and shit. You weren't talking much about Spicks back then and shit. You sent him a little video of a sewing yeah. machine. Like yeah, yeah, fuck dude. yeah. It's, that's why if you're racist, you better not have a sister. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was late, man. I felt, for me, it felt late losing. Yeah. For a while, I, how old did you say you were? I, I was in college. It was my first year of college or something. Yeah. or No, my, it was my second year of college. How old so were you the 20? first time you fingered a woman? Oh, I don't even, to be honest, I don't I don't really remember. It, might, it wasn't, I, I did that before. It was probably 18, maybe sometime in college. I didn't do anything. I had sex. Before. I didn't do anything I in high school. I had really sucked my dick. Like I had had sex and I was old already. Like when I when I messed around with Gina, I was sixteen or fifteen or sixteen, but we didn't do nothing. We just stuck it in a hole, and I moved it around. I shot a load, and yeah. she was bleeding uh -huh. a little bit. I didn't take anyone's virginity. But it was crazy that after I got my heart broken that time, I became a piece of shit. Yeah, for like two or three years, I was just banging chicks virgins, yeah. and then I would call them up and date, break up with them on the phone. <laughs> I was cold blooded. I dated. Two girls that were crying on the phone. I'm like, I'm not dating you no more. Once I busted that hymen, I would send them like a, a to go oh, car. Shit. It was terrible. I think I remember the first time I fingered. I think I might have been 18, 17, 18. I met her on Craigslist. I forgot about that. God damn. We, we dated. I actually dated someone from Craigslist. We, we, she picked me up from the train. I was in college. Oh my god. And and she was like, I, I'm not gonna come home with you, but I'll give you a hand job and you can finger me. So that was I was yeah I was 18. Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. So you you met her on Craigslist? Oh yeah. And, but I, like I was nerdy as fuck. I was yeah. So, but like, what you were like looking for for a girlfriend? Yeah, for for not even like hooking up to be honest. I was just so shy that I it was before online dating really. Wow. So I, I, I yeah, we didn't have that uh, back in the day, man. No, we, we did it old school. Like <laughs> there was no, there was nothing like that, dude. It was like oh, I'm oh not proud I heard of it, I heard so and so is like doing so and so so you might want to oh everyone else was I, just, I wasn't doing i could i was so fucking shy i know what happened yeah. i know exactly what happened like i fooled around and i got taken to a hookah house 
And after that, I was very careful and very like selective and shit like that. And then I, I worked as a doorman in a massage parlor for Louis Donato one summer, and he mm. got me like a blowjob from some crazy chick. <laughs> And still, I, I don't count it because you know what, man? It wasn't really somebody who cared about you. You cared yeah. about them. It's so weird. And then I fell in love with a girl and I had <clears> sex with her. And it was weird that I was in love, but we had the sex. And after that, we didn't see eye to eye. Hmm. Like we were in love for four years. We had sex. And that was it. Just that. once? And that changed my outlook. Wow. Yeah. Wow. We had sex like two nights. And that changed my outlook on. After that, I was 20. 19, I was headed out there, and now I knew the game. Like, right. There, there's no way you could snap me. It changed. Yeah. It was weird. Yeah. <clears throat> it was very weird how it came and went and how you reacted. Mm -hmm. But after those two relationships, I was, that's it. I was done with in my mind. Yeah. I thought I knew how to treat women and the whole fucking deal. And I was still not ready. Yeah. Because I think I got married at 25, 89, or whatever 89 is. Hmm. I was 26 when I got married, and I was not ready for marriage. There wow. was no fucking way. Yeah. Were you ever married? Never. Anybody come close? Mm, I was proposed to once, um, but it didn't, obviously didn't work out. Like How it was, a, it, um, Jesus, this was probably uh, like 20 years ago, maybe. I was probably like around your age, dude. And were you, you in a band to? already? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Traveling I was, on the road. I was, I was uh, in local. I was in regional bands. Like I was, ban I was in bands that was that you know we would tour like you know in the states, like the southern states or up north and shit like that. Original not, music. Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but it was before like my first record deal. So it was like I was on the verge of getting signed with my first deal, and. Um, this particular girl had never dated someone in a band and she was extremely jealous and um and i you know I, I was i was not definitely not ready for it at the time either and we were just i think we had been dating for like a year or something like that and um and she just like one night proposed to me like fucking ring and the whole bit and i was like fuck like <laughs> like we had just got out to dinner man and we went back to to her place and uh she just broke that out and i was like fuck i was not expecting that and so i told her i had to think about it which is basically no and it, it wouldn't have worked out anyways because we were just two different people and and um you know she was just like if if she just saw girls around me she was already like blowing up and fuming and shit like that and it's tough you know in this business and 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 being that age and uh you know just getting my career started i've never even heard you know? of someone getting proposed to before that's the coolest thing i've ever heard <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what year did you join ministry uh 12 years ago 2006 wow and you yeah. write a lot of shit i read too yeah yeah a I'll lot of the music 100 percent thank but. god yeah um i heard him on burr and he was interesting too oh uh, yeah dude burr, uh, bill came to our rehearsal um remember uh when when was that? Um, a few months ago. Yeah, three four months ago, we were rehearsing uh, here at, in North Hollywood, and uh, Bill came down because Al had done his uh, his show, and uh, he got behind your kit, didn't he, for a little bit? And... At the first show in Anaheim. No, but at rehearsal, he was like yeah, he was yeah. kind of behind your kit and shit like that. But um, yeah, I mean, when I first came on board with Ministry, um he flew me out to texas because he was living in el paso at the time and that's where he had a studio and he was just like yeah i want you to help me you know write the new record and i didn't know i'd never written with him before so i didn't know how much writing i was going to get in and um like the first day i showed him one of my riffs and he's like yeah that's you know that's cool call me when it's done and he leaves the studio and it's just me and this engineer who i just met and i basically like recorded um all the music to this one song i did all the guitars i did the bass i did some of the keyboards and like two or three days later he came back and he's like all right let me hear what you got and so he heard it and he's like awesome he's like what else do you have so i played him another idea and he's like cool call me when it's ready and he leaves again and so i i ended up like writing half of that album 
like the music to half of that record. And I played the guitar on that entire record. And um, so that was like my my first record with him. And I thought I was just going to write that that record. But as soon as I finished that one, he was like, oh, I want you to do this cover cover up record. And so I stayed another like month and I did that one. And then I did a Revolting Cox record with him as well. And uh, that cover up record is, is the one that got me my first Grammy nomination. And um, that was fucking 12 years ago, dude. I did like three records in a row out in Texas. And um, and then we started rehearsing and we went on tour. And I mean, I've been with him ever since. I don't even know how many records I've, I've done with him now. Probably like five or six or something like that. And um, how yeah, long does it take you to write a song? Once you put your head to that song and know exactly where you're going. It 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 always varies. Um, sometimes it, it's already written in my head and I literally just pick up a guitar or something and it just kind of comes out. And then other times I have a general idea, but I have to kind of work on it. And it could take like weeks, you know. But usually, like say today if i if i decide i want to write a song i could probably have something written by the end of the night um whether it's any lyrics, good or not lyrics no or i just music. do music yeah i only do music you just do music yeah okay. al does all the all the lyrics and shit so, and that's and that's been the case with all my bands i've always just done the music so you can do music without knowing what the songs like so yeah th- they base like the th- energy of the song off of whatever you just did and then they yes. write lyrics to it correct oh very cool. i yeah. thought it was which, the other way around which is well some some writers do lyrics and then do the music according to that but in all the bands that i've ever been in um it's always been music first and then you know like the singer the lyricist will get uh or he usually have lyrics kind of set in mind and he'll be like oh okay this should go well with this type of music and shit like that crazy yeah but i mean it's been like that i've been writing songs since i was 10 11 years old what's your i mean it, it, some people don't like this question but what's your favorite part do you like writing playing touring like what's your favorite thing to do record um it's tough to answer writing writing gives me a different high uh but it's between writing and and performing not so much touring but actually being on stage and performing really yeah it's those two things writing gives me just as much of a high as performing does but it's different it's a different kind of high because like when you're performing like you've got you know the crowd right in front of you and they're giving you that energy and when you're writing i mean it's just you but it's it's a different high that you get you know when you when you realize that you're creating something and that literally like you start out with a blank slate and it's for me at least it's really exciting to just feel that that energy coming through me that i'm i'm writing i'm creating something and i know that in a few hours i will have this kind of thing that i've created from nothing and so that's equally as much of a high as, as performing I, I think it was the last time you came uh what was the, the, we watched that documentary on netflix about and i forget the term hired guns hired guns hired guns, hired yeah. guns. so do you, if you were a hired gun you'd feel like you'd like it but there'd be a piece missing like i, I miss writing like it, it's it, it's not enough just to play i mean i i don't know that i would feel something's missing because um you're you're still playing which is something that i mean that you love to do so i mean i've been a hired guy many times and i don't feel like anything's missing i just love writing you know um a lot and not everybody writes you know everybody people there are guys out there that just play they're just in bands and they just play their instrument and you know okay here's the music learn this and that's great you know that's fine i mean those guys are still feeling that high because that they love playing and shit but for me, it's like it's everything that's involved from the from the the you know starting point of having nothing to seeing it you know the end result you know on stage in front of like fucking fifty thousand people. It's like it's a trip to be up there sometimes when we're playing something that I wrote at home with my acoustic guitar that you know like eight months a year you know uh, before that there was nothing and now you know all these people are like fucking pumping their fists and singing back stuff that you know we we wrote so it's it's pretty fucking cool man it's a, i mean it's a huge high you're such a beautiful a guy huge high, man like, to watch you play the guitar on stage i mean i've seen a lot of guitar players that just i feel it with you you're into it you 
you know, the big thing around here is when you commit, the universe takes care of you. Yeah. And, you know, like I've watched movies and had friends that have <clears throat> been in bands that have been cover bands. Mm -hmm. And obviously to break out, you have to write your own original material. Sure. But when you're playing Poughkeepsie, New York on a Friday night, they don't give a fuck about Sin's <laughs> music. Which you know we have, we Which have you played have. Poughkeepsie many yeah, times. Yeah. <laughs> they don't really give a fuck about, oh, this is about a girl I met right. when exactly. I was having a mocha latte in <laughs> Hollywood last summer. You know, this is a little song for your little ditty for you. People get pissed. Yeah. They come fuck back yeah. from that show like, I went to see Santana. He talked about political shit the whole fucking time. He didn't play Black Voodoo Woman or whatever. Right, right. Is, you know, <laughs> Black Magic Woman, you know. So it's such a fucking, again, if you're a comic, you want to just perform like I did for 10 years, there's a stage for that. Yeah. And you can write on the run and take chances on stage. There's a market for that. Yeah. But to get to the upper level, just like in music, they want to know what's in your heart, what's sure. in your mind, and how you stand with it. And what, you know, okay, you told yeah. us that joke, it's dirty, but why do you feel that way? Right. You know? Right. It's funny, I'm a week away from taping a Netflix special. Is that the one that you're doing in, yeah, in um, Vegas? In Vegas. Next week. Damn. 28 minutes. You know, awesome. I've had an hour for a year. And yeah. I said, this is not what I'm using. This is what I'm using. I get on stage next Monday at 7. I just want to tell you people that I got 20 minutes. I still got eight minutes that are missing. Mm -hmm. And I don't give a fuck. Sure. Like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. It's going to work because you commit to the universe. Of course. And the universe. And, and every day, my wife got me an iPad for Christmas. And the first time I've ever written on an iPad completely different ball game <laughs> like now i could move shit like now wow. i see it in a notebook right i got one page for that right. particular bit now you see the bit so it's like flashcards. wow so it's a different experience i've been doing comedy for 27 years and you're still learning something sure so when i saw all this big stuff about you writing i was like that energy for years i could write a joke on stage yeah thank and I'm, Pray that Lee's there taping it or Lee goes, hey, mm -hmm. don't forget that joke about fucking the bunny and lightning on fire. It was great. <laughs> Whatever. You know, but most of the time, I, I throw away more good jokes than right. most comics write on stage. Yeah. Just going up there high, just mm -hmm. talking. I, you know, I could go it's off. Flowing, yeah. I could do it every night. I just don't want to do it because you pay 25 bucks. Right. I don't want to take that chance. Right. You follow me? So it's just really weird the energy you get from writing. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know energy existed till I read the Stephen King book on mm -hmm. writing. Mm -hmm. And he broke it down about the energy that you get. And that's when I really got into it. Sure. And I wrote a few things uh, for the book, you know, that aren't any fucking good. But I still felt that energy going through my veins yeah. as I was writing it, which yeah. means there's something there. I'm not looking at it the right way. That's mm -hmm. all that means. Because mm -hmm. once you feel that energy, you're in the right fucking direction. Definitely. Music is always destroyed me i that that's where i tip my hat no i feel that anybody could write a good joke music is the one that as you're writing it i look at you in the studio and go this is going to be on the radio yeah i mean it's i feel the same with with writers or guys that do lyrics or write you know jokes scripts stuff like that that to me is like fuck those guys have a gift to me like writing music I'm like anybody can do that. That's how I see it. So um, it's a it's a different thing that I wish I had. I wish I had really gone into more of the the lyrical part of of writing as opposed to just music. But music, I mean, it, that's where it took me. You know, clearly that seems to be where um, if you call it a gift, that's where it is for me. Is is writing music because that seems to come easy for me um and natural more than anything it's like it's it's a natural thing for me to do it's not like um I, i'm ever like oh man i have to write something and what am i gonna do it's not like that no, for me. it just happens and i know that i i totally understand what you're saying where you know you're missing eight minutes out of your 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 act but you know it's gonna be i know there. it's there i know, know it's there know yeah, it is, i dude. feel it there. I, I totally relate to that when when i have something to do musically and I'm like, well, shit, I don't have X amount of time to do this, but I don't worry about it because I know that it's just it's just going to happen. I know it's there. And I know that when it's something that, that comes from the heart and it's something that's that is you, it just happens, man. You know, you don't have to like fucking 
uh, worry about it and what am I going to do or shit like that because you know it's it's just who you are and you know that it's going to show up. You know, it's never failed me to this point. You know, many times where I've been like, I have to have this song written or I have to do this or whatever and it's not done and I'm in the studio right now, you know, and the fucking clock's ticking, but I know that I'm going to have something written. I know it's going to come. It's never failed me. It you know? fails you if you don't do the work. Exactly. If you do the work, of course. it won't, know, it won't fail. Of course. Yeah. That's how I feel. Of like course. Every day I'm sitting myself down and it's not forcing myself. It's, no, it's not. It's, it's just not going about home that. and going, you know what? Yeah. I would have killed. Let me get down to the right. coffee shop right. and write this for an hour. Which piece. that, I mean, I, I agree with you that I label that. That's part of the work process. That's part of it. That's you gotta do that. Like That's you've gotta, you you have to have. You've got to put the work in. And I didn't know about this till five yeah. years ago. I didn't know. Got to put work. the work in. When I read the War of Art or whatever the fuck it is, the Art of War, whatever the fuck it is, it really opened my eyes to what needs to be done every day, not what you want to do or what you don't want to do. Right. What needs right to be done on a daily basis for you to be that person, for sure. you to be that guitarist, for ministry. You know how much pressure comes with that? It can yeah. come with or without pressure. Right. The pressure is if you just coexist right. and go hang out with Steven Adler right. and talk about the GNR days. Then you're just <laughs> going to be a sack of shit. Exactly. You hang around with donuts, you become a fucking donut eventually. <laughs> but if you go to the studio every day for two hours, and exactly. even, if you, even if you just go in, tune your guitars, play a couple licks, and just take that lick and play it, and then your girlfriend calls you and says, get home, I made pork chops. <laughs> and you go home, that fucking one hour still amounts to I agree. something. I agree. That's what I didn't know for yeah. years. I didn't know that that one hour, that's why when I started learning about that hour, I utilized it because at first I was doing the comedy hour, a pen in your mouth. Mm. And then you flip the pen over and you can taste the Coke you did two months ago through the fucking <laughs> big pen. You know what I'm saying? Your mouth is numb. Now you're trying to write... You feel like a Colombian farmer, confused. It's the afternoon and you got a coke rush in your fucking <laughs> mouth, and now you got to write a fucking joke or something, and and you don't write dick. Forty minutes goes by and you go, you know what? I'm getting the fuck out of here. I'm gonna go cop a bag of dope or whatever yep. the fuck it is that I do. Once I started sitting down and just going, okay, we don't have a joke to write. Let's write a story of the time me and Sin went to uh, Bakersfield and we got a flat on the yep. 405. You'll think of it. You're right. And while you're writing it, you go, oh, my God, there's a joke right there. Something's here. Boom. There yeah. you go. Yeah. And now I transform it into my act. And now you yeah. didn't waste an hour. Right. You didn't waste an hour. Yeah. You have a page that you're just going to run. As soon as that clock starts, boom, you start writing your story. I, I totally, totally don't agree Don't worry with about that. the commas. Don't worry about the punctuation. You don't need to spell it. Nobody's mm -hmm. a spelling bee. Just so you write it. And then you look at it, put the correction, and then rewrite it. And yeah. before you rewrite it, you'll think of a joke or a promise. Mm -hmm. I promise you. Because you're exercising the mind. Right. It's the same fucking thing. I, I agree that uh, um, for me, it's like every day, even if I just fucking grab my guitar and just strum a few chords That's it. on Tune it. Tune it, whatever. It, it, I mean, some nights, you know, I, I try to write as much as I possibly can just because it's, it's, it's always there. And... Um, I always try to just document, I record, you know, a riff that I have in my head, I just record it. And that could be it. That could be all the work I do that day with music. But I know that within that riff, I'm going to go back to it and I'm going to hear something, you know, just a part of it that will now trigger a song or trigger a different idea. But I think it's, it's very important that you do that you touch on that every day if you can if you're if you're if you are a guitar player pick up your guitar and just fucking play a little bit you know fucking if you if you feel inspired enough to write something write something um if you if you're not feeling the inspiration of a song at least just fucking grab your instrument just fucking play it just do something because i think you uh, for for my experience that keeps that flowing and it keeps that energy going um, I could never like completely walk away from the guitar and not touch it for weeks and shit like that. Like I couldn't do that. Like I don't think any of us could could do that. Any of the guys in, in you know in what we do. Even when it comes to drums, the yeah. same thing. You got to get on them every day, play them, put a little jam on, Absolutely. play over it yeah. a little bit. Yeah. yeah, it's just. I mean, I think it's it's. I think it's like it's in our DNA, and I think it's something that that we just. 
it's in our blood and and it's a natural thing for us it's not anything that we look at like you said like oh it's a chore it's it's even though i i call it work i don't look at it like you know what i mean it's something that i'm dreading that i have to do now that's like we never look at it like that you know and we get to do it yeah exactly yeah and then i mean the with me with writing it's like i could be driving home after this and hear some noise outside somewhere you know a car making a weird sound or whatever and that will trigger something in me that'll stay in my head and i will go home and just riff something out either on the bass or on the guitar or i'll program something on the drums because if it's a rhythm that i heard or something like that because i'll use whatever the fuck i have to to start an idea like it doesn't always just because i'm a guitar player doesn't mean it always starts on the guitar i've written songs entirely on bass i've written songs i've started songs with just a drum beat or a drum pattern and so it can be triggered by anything you know um and it thank god it seems to flow and it hasn't stopped yet so I'm I'm hanging in there hoping it doesn't stop anything. Right now soon. I'm writing a bio, like a bio for comedy. Yeah. The Centre Comedy Clubs. I'm writing a bio. I'm trying to write the book, a chapter. Yeah. And I'm trying to write stand up and I'm also starting nice. to write my next special. Nice. Immigrant mentality. Every day I apply to something. Sure. I write jokes every day. Yeah. But every day to get to the jokes, I go through one of those things. You put in the work. And huh? it always catches. It always yeah. so you're here an hour and a half. Go do something, and guess what? If I do that in the morning, I'll sit again at 7, and something else will come to me. Sure. And especially yeah. in the next couple of weeks, the next week, yeah. you know, well, I'm looking for eight minutes. It's ama- And I got eight minutes. I can throw yeah. any piece of junk in there and, and right. make it new. Right. It's not that. It's I want the viewer to really see a pounding. I yeah. really want to see a pounding. Where's Tony Bennett at, cocksucker? Let me give some shout-outs there to my man Matt Moore, A. Ferd. X95, Jack Jeffrey, my man D in Colorado, Cletus Augustus, the Val Colonel, Cecilia T, Snack, and Danny B Sports. For all your sports information, go to Danny B Sports. Tell him Uncle Joey sent you. Let me ask you this, because you're like in 22 fucking different bands, <laughs> which is great. I love it, because I was looking at that. That's another thing I want to talk to you about. So sometimes you're writing a song. And at the end, you see the finished product. You're like, "Fuck out! I'm not giving out this masterpiece." I'm I say going, that all the time. Actually, I'm going to this guy. <laughs> yeah, fuck out. Let Al come up with his own. Get him. Let him get a ukulele and stay up all night. Go buy a ten dollar bag of meth and see how hard it is to write this shit out, cocksucker. So every once in a while, you write a song. Do you feel it's for somebody else or a different yeah. band you're playing with? That's the hard thing. That's Definitely. What, that's when Definitely. you know. That's like for me. Sometimes I think of a joke and I'm like, "That's a little bit too much of a story for this fucking chapter in this joke." Yeah. Like now I'm seeing like you taped the ice house for me. I had to get rid of eight of those jokes. It's too long for the punchline. Okay. We got a half hour. We're killing punchlines. It's eight a in minute. In and out. You know what I'm saying in and out. It's like fucking you know, like sure. a fucking sewing machine. <laughs> well, whatever. What happens? Like, ha- has it changed? listening to music for you because now that i like it's sometimes i can't really watch specials because then i'll just start writing and i'll have to turn the special off because i have to write the idea down and then i'm, I'm done do like, you do you what it, it's changed for me in that usually um when i listen to stuff now i dissect everything right yeah and yeah. i hear the like okay i hear what this instrument's doing i hear what this is like it's almost like you're you're tearing it apart that's what it's like for me and i have to actually um try to turn that off when i'm listening to music so i can just try to enjoy right, yeah, the absolutely. song because for me that's what that's what ended up happening is um the more i wrote the more i dissected stuff that i would just hear like on the radio or, or an album or something like that so that's how it changed for me and i have to like really try to not do that like i have to make a conscious effort to not do that so i can hear it as a whole you know yeah i know it's fresh I, I i i you can ask joey i love watching specials and there's only been like a couple in the last. I've tried to watch a bunch in the last few weeks. And I've had to turn them off. E- yeah. Either I don't like them as much anymore, or I just I don't. You I'd... see through the bullshit now, right? Oh, okay. You see through the smoke. You see the smoke yeah. now. So now you see the. You look behind the curtain. Oh. So now it's completely different. You know, it's like they say you don't want to really meet your heroes. Right. You know, it's the same fucking thing. 
once you see behind the curtain, it's tough to watch fucking comedy anymore. Unless you watch it fucking live. Like, when I go to the comedy store early and I sit there, like, when I was talking about the fourth wall last night, sitting in the back and getting enamored by comedy is a great thing. Guess what? And I'm doing a special. I'm telling you this, that the special doesn't capture the comic. It really doesn't. And they don't know what they're doing. They tell you they know what they're doing, but they don't know how to do it. Look at the fucking videos from the 50s with Lenny Bruce and look at the, the specials today. I get more out of those videos with Lenny Bruce. I just don't know how to shoot that way. Mm. I don't know what they were shooting or how they were shooting it. They shot from the waist up. They kept the camera on that. You didn't. Mm. They didn't move. Now they want to show the audience the, the, right. the smoke, the people. It's too much. It's become too much of an artistic thing. Just shoot the fucking comic no. and learn how to get the maximum laughter out of it. They don't. Mm. They don't. So that's why when I see a special at my house, yeah, I have a good time. For 10 minutes. And then you see right there. I can't. I, there's never, you'll never hear me on this podcast telling you a special sucks or not because I feel the same way about all of them. The comic is being funny. Is his fucking patois coming through that lens? Not fucking really. It really, it really does not matter. Not fucking really. Like being in with a crowd. So when I go to the original room and I sit in Mitzi's row and I sit back there and I watch Burr and Ron White and Ali Wong and Chris D'Elia and Brent Ernst and Steve Simone, I'm sitting back there getting that full essence. You know, going, wow, now I got what I didn't see in the special. Right. He said that joke in the special and it sucked. This is great. Trust live, me. you get it. Live, you start getting it. Yeah. On video, I hate all of them. I'm not going to lie to you and tell you they're all fucking great. I've seen some fucking garbage the last 10 years. But not the comic. They've made them garbage because they take their focus off the comic. Mm -hmm. wow. you know, can you believe there's no more live music? When we were coming up, it was Cheap Trick Live at Budokan. Mm -hmm. The song remains the same. Mm -hmm. And there was one other one. Uh, who else? Dude, the UFO. UFO Strangers in the Night. Kiss did a bunch of them. Yeah. Who else did one that was really fucking good? Uh, not, so you're really Kiss influenced. Big time. Big time. Ace yeah. Freely's your Ace, man. Ace Freely, man. Yeah, fuck yeah. No that was shit. Like, that was like my first guitar hero was Ace Freely. Yeah. And he deserves every bit of that merit. I think he's yeah. phenomenal. I, I, I mean, he's, phenomenal. he's fucking, he's such a, I mean, he's, I feel underrated for what he, for what he did. Um, you know, he's not like a technical player, but that's not his style. Like his, he, he plays from the heart and it's fucking real. You believe it. Like you believe every, he can hang on one fucking note and bend the shit out of it. And it's it makes more of an impact than a guy fucking doing you know arpeggios at fucking a million miles an and hour. And this is all fucking you know? under the influence. Yeah, exactly. Those early hours. Oh yeah, I know. If he could redo those, I know. they would know. be masterpieces. And he's, I mean, he's out there again. He's going out with Alice Cooper, I think, in a, in the next month or two. But um, but he's he's by fucking himself back. or opening for Alice. He's opening for Alice, like his own, like the Ace Frehley band opening for Alice. And um, he's still fucking slaying it out there, man. And he's sober fucking, now. He's sober. He's been so sober now, he's now real for serious. About yeah, it. yeah, yeah. And his playing is still fucking it's still fucking up there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, mean, I love his interviews. Know. I've been trying to get yeah. him on the podcast for years. <laughs> he's hilarious because I think he's as funny as they come. He is, dude. He's as funny. That as would they be come. awesome if you could get him. Dude. He's tough. He doesn't want to leave yeah. Costa Mesa or whatever the fuck I know. he lives down there. I know. You know, I know. Uh, I know that uh, the one guy went down there and they recorded two songs. Yeah. You know, I listened to all the Kiss stuff, and like I said, I had a friend who was a Kiss guy, and me and him went to Kiss, and he died. Yeah, so I remember I my me. Kiss albums. With yeah. Him. So now, after thirty years, I've let myself to allow myself to listen to Kiss again. And yeah. Hear different interviews on Sirius AM radio, yeah. and I, I get goosebumps and shit. Sure. But I remember how much I liked. Hey, like I remember the first time I heard "I Want You," I almost fucking sued. I almost stopped. Like I love all that shit. Fuck yeah, dude! And who's your second most influential guitar player? Uh, Hendrix. No shit. Yeah. Third. Um, it'd be between fuck either Rhodes or Trower. Robin Trower. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 I mean, if we're talking old school, uh, Trower uh, of the newer, I would say Rhodes. 
Randy was you know, talking to you. Nobody talks dude. about that guy from what's that band? They have an album called Cricklewood Green. Love like a man. I don't know. What the fuck is that guy's name that played the guitar? They played Woodstock. Fuck. Um, what, what what do you got? Love like a man. Uh, ten years after. Yes. Oh, ten years what's, after. What's the guitar player's I name? The dude's name. I remember the band. But. Something green. Something Al. Something something. Ten years after. Uh, it's either Alvin Lee. Or Alvin, Alvin Lee. Lee. Oh, Alvin dude, he's, Lee. He's a fucking. Sick. He's a fucking. He's sick a monster. Dog. Monster guitar player. Yeah. I mean, he wasn't. It wasn't. The band wasn't a band that I was. No, 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 no. Nothing. As into. Yeah, nobody. But is. he's a fucking monster. monster guitar player. Dude. Yeah, no doubt about that. Dude. Now, was it you that was you telling know? me Randy Rhodes' mother was down right down? The yeah, corner, right here in North Hollywood. Yeah. No. Dolores. Shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we went to the same junior high. He went to Muir Junior High, which is the, the junior high I went to in Burbank. Um, I saw his mom a few times at her house when she was still alive. And um, But yeah, Randy was a fucking big influence, dude. You know, when I was like 13, 14, um, Rhodes just fucking blew me away. The shit he was doing was just fucking out there and... You know, to this day, I mean, just listen to those fucking, you know. That first album. Dude, that, that first, first fucking, album is, uh, Every song, dude, every solo, you remember it. It's all memorable. It's fucking, the playing is, is amazing. You know what my favorite solo is by him? Hmm. Goodbye to Romance. Oh, dude. Classic, Goodbye dude. to Romance, the solo gets Classic. me every time. If yeah. I'm in a light and I hear that, it takes me yeah. right back to whatever stupidity I was doing when that <laughs> album came out. Takes me right back. Dude, Takes you me know right back. what? a fucking highlight was for me was uh, about a year or two ago I got to play there was a um, because they do these Randy Rhodes tribute shows like once a year and I got to fucking play Suicide Solution with Rudy on bass that was fucking killer for me man to be able to do that Randy song did you do it to the fucking, team like a la Randy? Yeah, fuck yeah. Or did you add your own flavor No, to I it? did. I tried it because it was a Randy thing. So everyone was there to hear Randy's solos like Randy. So I kept it pretty pretty Randy-ish. And, I mean, dude, it was fucking... I, it was a trip just being up there, man, and looking over, and there's fucking Rudy fucking pounding you know, away on the bass, dude. We were giving props to fucking uh, Steven Tower before. Another guy that... You got to give props to as crazy as he now he's got his he does something on serious where he interviews he does an interview every once a month with a friend mm -hmm. and as crazy as he is he's still fucking Ozzy Osbourne yeah another guy yeah that came from the fucking trenches of death was dead mm -hmm. he was dead mm -hmm. he was dead guys he was above that liquor store where the <laughs> fuck he was living fucking dead you know no hope and all of a sudden the chick came by the manager yeah she told the father told him he was a sack of shit yeah he was just a junkie she thought different and it started a corporation that's worth dude it's massive massive like yeah. massive like, yeah and her you know. dad was a big shot too. yeah yeah don, yeah, yeah. don, arden, don arden, big yeah. shot thief yeah he robbed mm -hmm. those guys he made them all into junkies yep. i mean i'm i just finished reading the the, the man who led zeppelin oh and um, he worked for him. Yeah, yeah. He worked for him. That's how wow. he learned. That was his first job. He worked for him as security on, wow. on tours. And they brought Santana over and all those fucking bands from San Francisco, that shit. But it's just really weird when you look at even Ozzy Osbourne was dead. Yeah. Dead. They threw him out of his own fucking band. Like, they go, like get the fuck out of here. Like, <laughs> you're done. And then they replaced him. That guy sucked. Then they replaced him with Dio. <laughs> The guy that in between them, there's some music online that's just god awful. Is that who the, was the guy that came in? Was that um, Tony? The first guy that came in to sing was god awful. Yeah, I'm trying look to, up, I'm uh, trying to remember look his up name. Heaven and Hell with the fucking. If you go to YouTube, okay, and look up Heaven and Hell with the original singer. He's looking up porn over here. Yeah, no, no. What are you gonna do? <laughs> I have my needs in. Heaven and hell. So looking up skydiving. Yeah, or, uh, put on YouTube lining. on here. 
Okay. And it'll show you. It'll say, uh, heaven and hell. What the fuck is the guy's name? Ralph something. It was god awful. All right. So I have, I have, um, Ronnie James Dio. No. Ian Gillen. Tony Martin. Glenn Hughes. That's what I was thinking about. Tony Martin. Glenn Hughes. Ren Out Ray Gillen. No. Glenn Hughes. Glenn Glenn Hughes Hughes. was was from Deep Purple. Deep. Somebody came in right before fucking, uh, Ronnie James Dio, and they taped, they did a couple demos, and they said, listen, this sounds like somebody died. Oh, wait a minute. Yes. Wait a minute. Yes. Wait, 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 wait. wait, 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 wait. Yes. 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 No, it wasn't. No, I don't think it was Glenn Hughes. No, it was not Glenn Hughes. There was someone else. There was somebody else who came, and I found it. I found it once, and it was god-awful. I think he was the, wait. I don't see his name up there. I th- Dave Walker. Dave Walker was the first singer. Was it Dave Walker? Yeah. Heaven and hell, Dave Walker. Listen to this diarrhea. <laughs> <laughs> diarrhea of a madman. <laughs> Listen to that. The second one. Listen to fucking Junior's eyes with this fucking sack of shit. <laughs> And, and Sabbath was dead too. Musically, they were dead too. He was the first guy they brought in. Now, Ozzy hates this fucking album. You can't even bring this album around him. He says it's a fucking jazz band. <laughs> but listen to this vocal diarrhea. Wow. I think they brought him in and tried to squeeze Ozzy out, and they were going to stay on tour. And somebody pulled him aside and said, don't do it. Don't do it. Ozzy's Ozzy's lucky that you like him, because I can just imagine you playing this outside of his house with a boombox if you didn't (laughs) didn't like Ozzy just all day. Dog, when I heard that, because I remember reading it. All we had then was Cream Magazine (laughs) and Circus. Circus. And I remember reading it at Circus. They would play them with Dave Walker. Ooh. But it, something didn't work out, <laughs> and then they Dude. found Dio, and even Dio was hard to swallow. When I first drove to Philadelphia and I saw Dio on stage, I almost started crying. Though. <laughs> I almost started crying, and then I played it out, and the hand was pretty fucking good. Yeah, except for the devil horns and shit, yeah. <laughs> he was okay. But the best thing about that concert was this is how crazy life was, Lee. It had to be summer of '81, maybe. And we drove down the shore, me, this guy, but I know I don't know who the driver was, but I know I know this kid, rest in peace, was in the mm-hmm. car. His name is Dan Rago. He was five foot two, steroided out. <laughs> he had to be hundred and ninety pounds of pure muscle. Wow. And in those days I would make him take his T shirt off and do push ups. <laughs> like I'd get him all jazzed up, like do a couple lines of coke and give him a couple cocktails. And I'd say, Darren, take your shirt off. Do some push-ups, dog. Get ready for these motherfuckers. <laughs> we could be anywhere. And I wouldn't make them do push-ups. Like, we're going to a bar. Darren, come in. Do a line of blow. Do some fucking push-ups. And he would do 200 push-ups and be yoked. Damn. And he'd walk in that bar with no shirt on in 81, and he didn't give a fuck. <laughs> so we stop in this fucking restaurant, like a Burger King, like mm-hmm. one of those. And, like, you know, he's talking to people. Like he's fuck. We're doing coke. It's yeah. two in the afternoon. We're doing a couple bumps. We're already on acid, and we're going to see Dio with Sabbath. You know who was opening for them? The singer from Van Halen, when he was with Shaken Street. 
that guy that's in Cabo Wabo. Uh, that Hagar. Fuck, Hagar was in a band called Shaking Street. Oh, wow. And they, was, and they were spitting on him. <laughs> in Philadelphia, they were spitting on oh their fingers God. and flinging the spit with their fingers. He was on stage ducking it and shit. <laughs> it was fucking hysterical. Why don't they like Sammy Hagar? I don't know. I don't ask questions. If I see people <laughs> getting spit on in Philly, I mind my business. <laughs> but my man, Darren... <laughs> came back and that was his name Darren Rago God rest his soul he came back into the car and he goes look dog look what I got I got acid right and it was this it was microdot mm -hmm. but in those days the hot acid was microdot or paper acid he had got me things that looked like earplugs that were purple just a little smaller than earplugs mm -hmm. I go what type of fucking acid is this he's telling me it's devil acid he traded two lines at THC <laughs> <laughs> for three hits of acid, hysterical. So we get to the thing. I tell him, you know what? Hold on to them. I'll pass. So it was like six bands. It had to be like a broad band, and then it was Sammy Hagar, and then it was somebody else, and then it was Black Sabbath. Not only that, listen to this one. We had like 13 row seats, and some guy came up to us, and he's like, listen, man, uh, can I talk to you guys? I'm like, what's up? And he goes, listen, I came here with four of my friends, and two of them just beat me for coke or something. I don't want to sit next to them. Do you mind trading your tickets? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he goes, I'm sitting in sixth row center. I'm sitting in 13th. Holy shit. And you want these tickets? He goes, I'd rather sit with where you're sitting and sit next to these two assholes. I go, let's see if it's legit. Right yeah. in the arena. We walk right to the seats. I shook his hand. He's like, fuck you to his friends. Fuck you, <laughs> motherfuckers. You fucking barfs. We were sitting six row center. Oh my God. So here's me and Darren on the purple plane. So at first, the music was great, you know. I'm watching these people spit at Sammy Hagar. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Didn't you get hit by something in the six row? No, no. no. Black God. Sabbath comes on, and Dio comes out there with his little devil finger. Yeah, yeah. Generals gathered at his masses, just like witches at black masses and he's saying all this stuff. i'm like oh this is a fugazi <laughs> yeah. and when i go to say something to darren he's out on the floor <laughs> he's done he's on the floor sleeping so at one point i'm like i said we got to get out of here so i pick him up and he's like holding our arms and we carry him out to the car <laughs> we throw him in the back seat we're like what the fuck happened to him and we're driving home and when he woke up he woke up like angry like <laughs> And we're like, dog, what happened with those purple quaaludes, right? Because we kept calling them purple quaaludes. You know what I'm saying? They ain't fucking quaaludes. That was pure acid. I was tripping at the thing. Like, dog, the only time you were tripping was on the floor. You were passed out. No! We tormented him from 1980 to the day he died about the purple quaaludes. Every time he got, I could get quaaludes. They're not purple. I'm like, fuck you. Fuck you. Those were acid. I know. I, I saw things. <laughs> We call them purple ludes to the day he died. That's a purple lude. Fuck you. Nice. Oh, my God, John. <laughs> <laughs> I remember one time we robbed the gas station every night. And another guy on a Friday. And the cops are looking for I don't know. They, they didn't know. There was no cameras or nothing. We got like 800, 900. Oh. Damn. We just hit the guy in the head with like a new chuck and just took his <laughs> money. And we shot down the shore. <sighs> And on the way down there, we stopped and got an eight ball. Like that was our plan. Like we each got it. We each got an eight ball, and we walked away with like sixty two fifty. <laughs> so then we get the seaside. You were going to jail for an eight ball and sixty two fifty. Two eight balls, three eight balls, <laughs> one a piece at two fifty a piece at seven fifty, and we had like two hundred left over. We robbed the gas station for like nine eighty, just a little <laughs> short of a thousand. So we got three eight balls. We filled the car up with gas, and we chopped up the rest of the money three ways. That's how partners do it. So we ended up driving down the shore. We got a hotel room. That's a small four. Yeah, there goes the 6250. And then, yeah, and then we got away with beer. So we're sitting yeah. there, Darren, me, and somebody. I think it was Stinky. It's got to be 82. <laughs> we're fucking getting coked up to the gills. And all of a sudden, we hear, and Red Darren opens the curtain, and it's like a Haitian maid. And she's blacker than black, and she's yelling oh. and Haitian. And I'll never forget him going, fuck you, and like closing the curtain. There's a black woman out there yelling at some language I never heard before. I'm like, Doug, the Haitian, just leave her alone. She won't come in. She tried to fucking open the door. And he's yelling, and I'm going to knock her out if she comes in. I'm like, Darren, you can't knock out the fucking Haitian maid. <laughs> did he go past check in or check out or something? What happened? what happened? I don't fucking know. We just sat in this hotel room and did the eight ball. We woke up the next day, and we went back home depressed. Because we depressed. robbed the gas station for no fucking reason. I that you ever do that you, sin? No, I, I never. I was just gonna ask you. Does that sound like 
Sin was you've a done. good guy. Sin's a decent guy, and you're even more of a decent guy. They don't do things like this. You <laughs> understand me? Only animals like me have a good time. It's funny because now I sit back and I go, you know what, bro? Half the fun I had because it was the drugs. Yeah. Like half the fun. Like I would love to sit here and go, you know what? Don't do drugs and live your life. And half the fun I had was the adventures. <laughs> Either getting the drugs, doing... I mean, I ended up kidnapping somebody, putting them in the trunk of a car. I laughed my ass off about that today. Nobody got hurt. Yeah. There was a potential... You went to jail for two years? <laughs> there, 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 was, there was a potential for violence. Oh, my God. What are you talking about? <laughs> but at the end of the day, nobody got hurt. He's a little psychologically scarred. Oh. Yeah. He's got PTSD and a couple other things. He might have a rash or something. But... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You don't, you don't see jail as a negative? Not really. It was a positive. <laughs> I'm here, right? It, it worked. It's how you look at it. Like. It's how you look at things. Yeah. Jail was exactly what I needed at that time. Yeah, a couple, so you, a couple oh weeks God. away from society. A couple years. Get your head weeks. together. Who gives a fuck? It turned out to be a it positive thing. It turned out to thing. be okay. Yeah. It got me ready for the next yeah. 20 years. <sighs> what would have happened if I wouldn't have got caught then? I would have got caught now. And let me tell you something. Being in jail when you're 50 is a lot harder than being in jail when you're 20. Yeah, fuck that. When you're 20, you can at least fight to the death. When you're 50, you're getting fucked in the ass. <laughs> I was thinking about that last night, about that scene from... Uh, American Me? No, from uh, the uh, Sons of Anarchy, when the guy who wrote it and directed it is getting like assaulted in his cell every day. He bites his tongue off. In other words, That's he's getting fun. dicked up the ass by one big black dude. <laughs> And the guy eats his lunch, which makes it even worse. Is that worse. what you were trying to say, Lee? Yeah, sure. I was trying to keep it PG for, for yeah, a second. Well, PG of the for who? Who gives a fuck? <laughs> we don't keep it PG. And he's getting sexually assaulted. <laughs> they show that yeah, on the, Sons of they ran oh, a, fuck they, yeah. they ran a really? train on I've him. never seen it. Yeah, they show a lot yeah? of shit on Sons of Anarchy. He bit his own wow. tongue off. And, spoiler, it's like 10 years ago. So. Yeah, if you haven't watched Sons of Anarchy, there's no spoiler attack. The show's been canceled for four fucking years. Go get a fucking life. Spoiler alert. Who gives a fuck? I would tell talk about the episode the next day and people would get pissed. I'm old school. I watched the fucking thing with commercials the first time. Yeah. When it is, so there's no mistake. If you're not going right, to watch right, it like right. that, you're not really a fan. Yeah. Me and my that. wife would go to dinner. We'd get home five to seven. I'd take three hits of the pipe and Sons of Anarchy would come up. But after we would take a shower and give a stab and it's date night. Everybody bah. gets a fucking, everybody has a good time. Bah. <laughs> no big fucking deal. No, you come here often. Boom, done. Yeah, done. Right? Look at Lee. That, that girl, that poor girl, dated for four years, never came in the mouth. What do you got this show? Nothing. Not one shot to the mouth. Not Tell one pa. Wait, Tell but let saying. me let me ask you this. Wait, yes, sir. Was, was like was that something that you guys just agreed on? Yeah, like he took it. I don't, like underst- I don't well, understand. I don't understand. I mean, I ask and. I'm not, if, if someone says no, I kind of leave it there. I don't really push the envelope. Well, you bit. never ask. You just pop the load in their mouth and let them wait for the reaction. For, but they, for but five I mean, years but, you were but, with her and she told you no morning sex and you bought into it. Okay, she doesn't like sex in the morning. Then don't live here. I love sex in the morning. <laughs> yeah, and you can't live here. Because I'm going to give you a stab in the morning. Well, I told you I don't like it. Listen, it doesn't really matter what you like. <laughs> I'm paying the lights. I'm paying the fucking food bill here. You're driving back and forth to work. Nobody's sucking dick. <laughs> you know, just because well, you got a mother. That's what we want to say, but we can't say I, I yeah, no, you have to say it. Because if you don't say it, then oh, look what happens. Exactly. Four or five years later, and you, you still haven't come fucking, in the mouth. Yeah. A girl tells me don't come in the mouth, that's the first thing I do. I knock her wig off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? If a girl tells me, like, on a date, I really don't like when guys come in my mouth, I drink eight milkshakes on the next <laughs> date. <laughs> I shoot a load in her mouth that she'll never fucking come back again, or she'll come back for yummy. Coming out of her ears and shit. Yeah, dude. I don't have yeah. time for that shit since day uh, one. I played yeah. that I'm a romantic game for a while <laughs> until you get fucked in the ass. They tell me what they don't like, and that's the first thing I do. I don't like when a guy farts in my fight when I'm getting <laughs> yeah. a blowjob. That's the first thing I do is blow a fucking nut right in their face. I don't give a fuck. And if they pull away, I come in their eyes, so be it. <laughs> so be it. So I, did you, I mean, was it like a, a uh, healthy uh, sex life, Lee? Or? I mean, yeah. No, no. Was, Look at him. He's damaged. He's damaged. It was it, four years. He didn't do it nothing. It slowed down towards the end, but that happens. But yeah. But I mean, but did you like. At did, 29? Th- yeah. 29. Listen, when I dated that stripper, I fucked her every day for four years. I got my money's worth out of that dirty bitch. Every day, except for a period. I did something to her. Those five days, I stayed away from her like a leper. Like she had the hiv. <laughs> 
But for, for, <laughs> then that sixth day, I'd give her a stab, and by the eighth day, I'd be eating her pussy and ass and finger to the death until blood came out again. Oh, my God. That stripper, I remember how it breaking up and made me going, do you think I really care that you broke up with me? I fucked you every day for four years. I got my money's worth out of you, you <laughs> filthy animal. Every piece of sushi, every bottle of wine. You're romantic, yeah. Yeah, because when you're not sucking and fucking, and they order wine at $60 a pop, Dude. you're sitting there getting angry. Yeah. But if you know you came in the hair, you fucked away. I put a bottle in the pussy one time, and yeah. it sucked the period juice out. <laughs> I did things to that poor girl. I had a good time. I mean, we still You wouldn't talk. do the farm animal. No, we're still friends because she's an animal. She even told me she's still an animal at 50. She's a fucking animal. But. Uh, oh, my God. No, every day I got your money's stabbing. worth. Yeah, that's the yeah. truth. I give you a gram of Coke to do. I'm getting my money's worth out of you. There's no way you're leaving here alive. Nobody snorts for free. You're sucking something. You give me a titty show. I don't give a fuck. I'm no I'm Harvey. I'm doing something. I'm no Harvey right, Weinstein, right. but I'm no fucking half a fag. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? I'm going to sit here and give you half my blow. Yeah. Well, you're not going to suck it. I got to hear stories about your boyfriend. Not on this planet. I think people take blow a little bit more seriously than I took like ramen and stuff because I, I didn't buy it. <laughs> I didn't buy a blow. <laughs> I bought a dinner. Like that's it. And that was, we yeah, had for four fucking years. Yeah, and, it turned and, out and, to and be that, up, that, dude. that were terrible. Add that up. That you got talked into, wait online, her girlfriends. All those bad concerts you went to, Long Beach for New Year's. Remember that one? That was an investment and opportunity. The time you went to the jacuzzi and had a scar. The time you broke the zip line. I it didn't was break the zip line. All the Groupons and all, all that All the Groupons. Shit, that adds up. Huh. And you'll say now that you won't go to a strip club. Listen, you go up here, that chick up there for the small 300s. You'll take you upstairs. That's way too much at and once. And suck the protein juice out You're of you. You're going to get me for six know. dinners, I guess. I, I mean, six I can't. dinners is 180. <laughs> no, see, I, Six dinners at fucking what? 60. It's yeah. three sixty. That's what I'm saying. For three hundred, you go up there. I think it's two sixty. You could fucking come in the face, and you give her a forty dollar tip, and First nobody all, feels they're guilty. Uh, you can't. You're not supposed. Like, what happens if the cops roll in? Who cares? You're coming on her face. That have yeah. nothing to do with you. Tell them to wait their turn. Yeah. Like, tell them to wait the their turn. Put the badge away. Put the gun away. The whip is dead. Put the put the whip <laughs> away. The horse is dead. You know what I'm saying? What do you want from me? I think that's illegal, isn't it? No, it's not illegal. <laughs> <laughs> You go to look at he's doing the Jew noises. Yeah, he's, like, yeah. Yeah, he's no, making just, the Jew noise. He's making sure any young kids here don't start to go jerking off in fucking strip clubs. <laughs> listen, Joey Diaz said I could. Listen, you go in there, it's dark. What do you think happens in dark spots? You jerk off. That's what happens. Women are walking around nude. What do you think's gonna happen? You think those girls don't go home once in once a week with jizz on their leg when somebody's shooting? Dude. You go into that back room up there, they do dirty things to you. And then you go upstairs and they do even dirtier things to you. There's upstairs? There's upstairs. That's what I'm trying to say to you. You give them the 260 That's a lot of money, though. You give them a $4 tip, and you do oh, whatever. $4? $40. Yeah, but add, add up all the ramen yeah, prices. Yeah, all the, the shit you put up with. And, and you still pubs, didn't get. And you still and didn't get. And spectacular and all that shit. You give the girl the small 260 You oh, shoot her mouth, you go home and sleep like a baby. You're like, you didn't do nothing. She's How used to it. you do that, though? That's a lot of Once money. Once a day. What do you give a fuck? <laughs> 260 I don't give a fuck. How many times you go in there? Once a week? I don't, who gives a fuck? Jesus it's better than sitting at home and looking at four walls like the guy from fucking, what's that band? At least I got 260, though. What 260? You dropped four years of fucking dinner. I know, but now it's two done. Years now now I have to resave up for the next four years. Once they tell you, you I don't like coming my mouth, you go, really? Me neither. <laughs> that makes and two that of next us. Next blowjob, <laughs> you make sure you come double quick with mushroom juice and asparagus in oh you. Oh, my God. And Pineapple. watch them make that Chinese face like something's not right. And they Broccoli. drink water. They brush their mouth. They Listerine. And it's still stuck in their fucking throat. Yeah, what like, if you like them? Hey, this is who the gives a fuck? This is what happens if you like somebody. You got to drink the goo. When I'm sucking your pussy and you spray at me, what do you think? I get out of the way? No. I inhale that fucking stay right in there, juice. Man. Yeah, stay right in there. Did Someone's, you guys did you guys do everything? Was everything like no, well, obviously not. Obviously not, but we didn't, I mean I, I'm not honestly, I'm not really up. into anal, but I'm he didn't pull a hair, he didn't come on a face. I, I, I've one never time. done that to anybody. I would have pulled my dick out of her mouth and slammed in the mouth with it and put it back so she doesn't <laughs> oh know what's God. going on. This and sounds worse than, than fucking. And whatever. it comes out like this. Sounds <laughs> When it comes <laughs> when it comes out and it makes that noise. Like that. Like that. That's fucking tremendous. And when with that note, what's the tour? Where's the next tour start? <laughs> okay. this, uh? Uh, when's the next tour? July 11th, 11th. Europe. Really? Yeah, we're in but Europe how long? for uh, five weeks. More like six. Month and a half, maybe. Jesus Christ. Something like and that. And what spots are you going to in Europe? 
uh, Spain, Germany, France, Italy, what else? Czech Republic, maybe? Um, Ireland. Ireland. UK, yeah. Yeah, so we're out there. Like, yeah, July 11th to like August 18th or Or 22nd. uh, Something like that. It's like five or six weeks, something like that. And then we're home for um, two months. And then we're doing another U.S. tour, I think, November, December. But we've got this, uh, this, I started this kind of power metal side project that's like old school metal. And um, it's called Three-Headed Snake. And we're actually mixing that thing. It's an EP that I hope to have done in the next like month or two. And uh, that's like old school fucking power metal, like from the 80s and shit like that. Like Judas you know? Priest. Yeah. Like it's uh, like that. It's like that kind of shit. The second like, side. One day in it's the like world. fucking. It's like like uh, a battering ramp. Yeah. It's like it's classic, like priest fucking kind of shit. Just heavy riffs, power metal. The singer's fucking amazing. And uh, Derek actually tracked the drums on that thing. So we got that thing going on too, man. So. How is there like a registry for band names now? How do you come up with a band name and not that hasn't been used? Well, I mean, you do have to, you know, get it um, trademarked and shit like really? that. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. It's way harder now. Yeah. Now yeah. Way What's it cost you now to trademark a band name? Um, it's like it's not that much money. It's like a um, hundred and something. That's not bad. To get, yeah, yeah, That's not bad. yeah. It's not. It's. I mean, it's definitely not super expensive to get it done. It's just doing the paperwork and shit. Sin, it, but, is, yeah. it has been a pleasure following you on social media. If Thanks, you don't man. follow Sin, you're fucking missing out. On, uh, it's he shows you a different type, like of what you think a musician's life should be. He shows you some <laughs> interesting fucking pictures. Follow him. I don't know if you put videos up. I mean, you just yeah. We have guy we have um, and we got a Twitter thing going on okay. now, which I didn't have the last time I was here um because people were after i did the show people were like wanting to find so out is it about sin the twitter. twitter it's uh i think it's sin kieran music yeah i think sin kieran music on twitter yeah Give a follow. yeah yeah you're an I interesting and a good soul thank you brother i appreciate it man and, uh, i appreciate it i felt it. bad because i didn't get the full patois from sin i didn't really know the experience and then i started looking at your pictures and all the interesting shit you do and i appreciate it man bro you're a solid uh you're very down earth which thank you man I've Thank seen them you. at all levels, and- dude. And I gotta say, man, there's a there's a group on uh, I think it's on Facebook that um, it's a church group. Yeah, mm-hmm. Scott Cunningham. These fucking guys, He's man. A good guy. Dude, good guys. I, I mean, my hat goes off to those guys because they have been nothing but amazing to me, and because of the show, obviously, and they've been. I mean, nothing but just the most supportive Good guys, yeah. dude, for, for, you know, supporting all the stuff that I have going on. They've been great people. So, I mean, I, I want to say thanks to those guys. And when I was on this last tour, a lot of, a lot of guys people. came yeah. up, man, and they were like, fucking heard you on Joey's fucking show. Wait and till you go to Europe. Dude, yeah, they a come lot out, of cool people, man, The church is solid, solid, It, it really solid. is, dude. It I'm really, really is. I'm really proud of the people that come to the shows. When I yeah. do comedy shows, the wait- waitresses always go, you know what, man? They were a little drunk and rowdy, but they were good people. They Very kept good people. Decent. So, Very thank you for people. being you. We rate yeah. you the best. You motherfuckers. Yeah. Do not back down from anything. Sin yeah. again. Thank you, and you could bring your man. dates on the website. Whatever the fuck you need. Awesome. You thank you, I man. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Don't forget a month right now, a week from tonight, I'll be in Las Vegas with Lee, taping the special. Thanks to you people and Netflix. And then on the sixteenth or something like that, I'm at Calusa Casino. There's a few tickets left, but. Before I leave, I got to talk to you about Blue Apron. It's the number one fresh ingredient recipe delivery service in the country. Blue Apron's mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. They achieved this by supporting a more sustainable food system, setting the higher standards for ingredients, and building a community of home chefs. Blue Apron offers three plans. You ready? The two-person plan, the meal plan, Meals that serve two people choose from eight recipes per week with a choice to receive two or three recipes any week. The family meal plan. Meals that serve four people choose four new recipes per week with a choice to receive two, three, or four recipes any week. And featured upcoming films. And they have a wine plan. But listen, Lee, 
What was the last thing you got? You said you just got a dish and it was oh, fucking tremendous. It was amazing. It was a beef. It was a beef bowl. It had rice, beef, and uh, I marinated that. It had broccoli and a, 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 po- a poached egg on top. It was called a Tokyo beef and rice bowl. It was delicious. There you go. Now Blue Apron is offering our listeners their first three meals for free. Three meals for free. When it comes to cook, when it comes to dinner, let Blue Apron take care of the planning and shopping while you do the cooking and the eating. This month, you'll enjoy delicious meals like popcorn chicken with sweet chili, cabbage slaw, and cumin spice wonton noodles with vegetables and peanuts on the table in 30 minutes or less with incredible ingredients and chef design recipes. Blue Apron lets you see what the power of food can do, all right? We want to hear the food you love to cook and eat, all right? We have a team of professional chefs putting in a lot of care into creating recipes each week. We need your help in bringing this food to life for your listeners. So some of the best parts of your day happen over dinner. We want you to share that with your people. Do you understand me? So when you get the recipe and you're cooking there with your wife or your loved one or whoever, your uncle or whatever, you're both learning how to cook. You're building a bond, which makes a better family. So check out this week's menu. Look what they got. They got pork chorizo tacos with radishes, roasted potatoes, and cotija cheese, salmon and spicy orange salsa with quinoa and carrot salad. Ooh, creamy pesto cavatelli with mushrooms and spicy breadcrumbs. And dig this one. You ready? White cheddar cheeseburgers with balsamic glazed onion and roasted potatoes. Are you kidding me or what? I'm going to give you your first three meals for free. At BlueApron.com slash Joey. BlueApron.com slash Joey. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Number two, listen, FujiSports.com. That's all I can tell you. That's all I can tell you. You're looking for a gi, you're starting jujitsu, that's the way to go. I don't care if you get the $99 gi or you get the 136 of Separito. It's going to be tough, dependable, and guess what else? Light. You ever have a gi on, you don't even feel. You, you, like, am I fucking naked? No, you got a gi on, cocksucker. Go to fujisports.com right now. Whether you're getting the shin guards, the boxing gloves, the Muay Thai gloves, listen, rash guards, they got it all. They always got a sale. Go to Fuji Sports night right now and press in. Church. And get 10% off delivered right to your house. You help out the podcast, everybody's fucking family, all right? I want to thank Blue Apron. I want to thank fujisports.com. I want to thank my man, Sin. For coming in, bringing the main man over here, nice Derek, guy. He hasn't thank said you guys. fucking word. <laughs> He's a gentleman. He drinks his water. He ain't bothering nobody. <laughs> I want to thank the flying Jew, but most of all, I want to thank the church family for being fucking gentlemen, and tremendous women, and for fucking supporting us and our cause every week. Thank you. Have a great day. We'll be back Thursday morning, ready to fucking rock. Don't worry about nothing. We love you. Stay black. Kick that fucking mule, Lee.